So if we establish rapport, and rapport, let me step back, is actually an evolution. Rapport starts with the phone call, right? The kind of call I teach, of course, a little bit different than the calls most people get, totally different. Um, and how we approach the, uh, the, the meeting is a lot different. We do something we call an upfront contract. We set an upfront contract for the meeting. How many of us have ever been on a call, five minutes into the call, the person on the other side is looking at their watch, looking out the window, doing email, pulling their cell phone out, looking down. Anyone ever have that happen? And, and, and part of the reason is sometimes we didn't set, we set a start time, hey, I'll see you at 10 o'clock. Great, see you then. And, and we're all happy, then we go, we drive to the place, and now at five minutes in, 10 minutes in, all of a sudden we've lost their interest. Well, they may have been thinking, they put in their calendar, oh, well, I'll give this person five minutes. You're on Outlook, it blocked an hour, and you're like, oh baby, we got an hour here. Well, you're, it'd be like starting a baseball game, not talking about the rules of the field before the game started. What might happen? You know, someone hits a line drive, it hits the back wall, and then bounces out of the field. Well, what do we do in the stadium when that happens, right? Why, why do the uh, managers go out to the mound with the umpires in a baseball game every single game? To talk through the rules so everyone's on the same page. Do we not do that in sales sometimes? What is the outcome that we're looking for today? Right, if I'm getting a lot of thinking over, start thinking about having a discussion up front about and, and incorporate that go for no thing, say something like, hey, geez, I really appreciate you coming out or, or maybe I went to visit you. And, and what I'd like to do today is learn about your situation. Another thing you may want to write down, be them focused. Not me folks, not about me, not about my product services, it's about them. I want to get to know you, learn about what's working, what's not working in your world, share with you a little bit about what we do, and, and at the end of the meeting, hey, you may determine we're not a fit. That's go for the no, by the way, that little slide I had before. You may determine we're not a fit, and I want you to be okay telling me that at the end of the meeting. Would you be okay with that? Who's doing that? Not too many people, and that, remember I said, if the others are doing it, don't do it. Yo, start being different, go for no early, to give this person who's too darn nice to tell you no, and out to say, hey, geez, I'm not interested. Does that kind of make sense? What do you think that does to, for them? You see physiologically their face relax when I do that. I do that all the time. I do it on cold calls. Yo, and my upfront contract is, hey, uh, let me tell you the reason I called. You tell me if it makes sense to continue. Is that fair? Those words just flow off my tongue. Because that's what I do when I'm on the phone. Who feels in control when I say those words? The prospect feels in control. Who's actually in control? I'm in control. So a subtle thing with these upfront contracts that we have all the way through the system is how do I do it on purpose to make the prospect feel like they're in control, which they want to have. What does that do to the wall if they feel in control? The wall is down. And, and so my goal up front is the sooner I can get that wall down, the greater the chance we can have an open and honest not misleading dialogue about what's really going on. And no is okay, right? You gotta remember that. Number, after I set the, uh, the upfront contract, I wanna probe for pain, not just facts and figures. Most people spend their call talking and not listening, not asking questions. And in the, the pain step of the Sandler system, what we wanna do is not only ask some surface level questions, but get deeper and deeper and deeper into a discussion and you'll find uh, one of the, the Sandler rules kicks in at this step, and you may want to write down 70-30 rule. The 70-30 rule is my goal on a call is that 70% of the time when I'm in front of a prospect, their mouth is moving and mine is shut. My ears are open, right? I'm listening, they're talking. And that happens in the pain step where I'm, I'm really getting to know them. And what do you think happens the more they open up and talk? The more you find out. So all these things that I don't find out and the things I'm looking to find out are, are, the th are the problems, challenges, issues that they have, big enough deal for them to contemplate spending money for my solution, right? Does that make sense? And, right, if I was Dr. Chris, uh, you know, I'd be looking at, hey, gee, so what, 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 what ails you? you know, what's hurting you? What brings you in today, right? It could be like that. That's what doctors do, right? And, oh, geez, you know, my shoulder hurts. So you, and they go, geez, so how long has that been going on? So tell me more, you know, so what's the impact of that? Ah, oh, well, it's keeping me up at night. You know, I'm not playing golf anymore because this thing hurts so much. What else? Another great question to write down, what else? Easy one to remember, what else and why are wide open ended questions which people will always give you more. Because one of the Sandler rules in pain is the problem the prospect brings you is never the real problem. 
meaning that I need to probe deeper and deeper to find out what's really going on. You know, Chris, would you relate to that? Sometimes when someone's telling you, that may not be the issue. It could be their back that's causing their hip to hurt or their knee to hurt, right? So you got to dig a little bit deeper. We want to be, and you may want to write these words next to this line, a reluctant surgeon. I want to appear uh, as though I'm a reluctant surgeon because I will tell you the risk you have in going in, doing the pain step, if you're like most salespeople I work, you, you learn the concept, I ask some questions, I got a little pain on the table. What do you think most salespeople do? Show up and throw up. Show up and throw up, right? I want to put a Band-Aid on the wound. So I got them open up, I'm like, oh, I feel really bad because I have this high need of approval, right? So I want to make them feel better. So I go, oh, geez, oh, yo, let me tell you how, you how we help you with that. And now once I start telling them how we help them with, with that, when do I get back to me asking questions? Never, it just doesn't happen, right? We just go on and on and on. It's hard to get back. So uncover pain. A couple other things with pain. One, if you have the opportunity to quantify the pain, quantify the pain in real dollars, depending on what you sell. You know, what is the gap between where they are and where they want to be, right? If I was a financial planner, I'd say, geez, how much, how much uh, uh, you know, do you think you need to retire and when would you like to retire? And how much do you have today? You can calculate that, right? And you're like, oh my God. You weren't serious, right? You didn't really want to retire when you're 65, did you? <laughs> yeah. You know that Social Security thing you're banking on? Don't bank on that, right? Um, so you, know, you start to get pain. Now the next thing, if you were able to quantify the pain, go for personal pain. And what that would sound like, I'll give you a good one. So how do you feel about this? How does this make you feel? Right, it could be a security system. Someone's neighbor's house was robbed, right? That's pain that they can feel. So how would you feel if that happened here? Is this a big enough deal? It's another good question to write down. Is this a big enough deal for you to seriously contemplate spending the money it's gonna to take to fix this? And go for no? I'm getting a feeling, if they hesitate to answer, because sometimes they do, your antidote to that is, geez, you know, in a nurturing way, I'm getting the feeling that you're really just not that serious about this. I told them they could tell me no up front. I dug some pain. And sometimes I'll even ask, geez, on a scale of one to 10, let me ask you, how pressing is this for you? Is this a big deal or a little deal? Or I'll say, geez, I'm getting the feeling this isn't a big deal. That's the coolest question in the world, by the way. Because what happens from that question, their answer, who's selling who? They're selling me on their pain. So go the opposite direction. It's proven in psychology. I, I could do two hours on that. Uh, next, assuming I got pain on the table and I quantified the pain, got some emotion, right? Because what stops people from taking action is it's just not compelling enough, right? You know, I, I had an insurance person call me, go, geez, you know, let me look at your policy. And I looked at this and I'm like, so it's gonna save me $10 a year. Like the headache of filling the paperwork out. I go, I'm really not interested in doing it. You know, I appreciate you coming out, but you know, I, I really don't care. You know, so if it isn't a big enough deal, don't fake yourself out to think that they're gonna change, change vendors. The investment discussion comes after pain. Why do you think we do that? Why would we have the investment discussion after pain? I'll give you the answer. The more pain you uncover, the greater the willingness is to spend money to fix it. So if I spend my whole time talking and not digging, I don't even know what the pain is. If they, you know, I, I, I always like to picture a painometer on the forehead of my prospect. And how do, you, how do I know when that painometer is going into the red? on their forehead, body language. I'm looking for their forehead to have little wrinkles in it. I'm looking for their eyes to squint. Then I have my ears open. I'm listening for sometimes four letter words that come back. I won't mention any of those, but I've had discussions. I know that they're in an emotional state at that point. And the willingness budget step is, do you think it's more about willingness or ability to spend? Which is more important? Willingness. Tastes great, less filling. I don't, um, it's it's uh, willingness. Right? The government is the best example in the world, right? Do they have the ability to spend the billions, trillions of dollars we spend each year? Or the willingness? We elect people who have willingness to spend money we don't have. That's what we do. So how many households spend money that they really can't afford? So they have car loans, they have education loans, they have mortgages, they have home equity loans, right? Bills up, the, uh, you know, up to their ears, and yet they have all this cool stuff, right? So people spend money that they don't have. Don't let that get in the way. Right? So don't, you know, we have to uncover the willingness. The willingness is linked to the pain. Neat thing to remember. Third, if I got all that on the table, let me ask you this, even before I go to, to the, uh, I'm almost done with this. Um, with the uh, budget step, how many of us 
after an initial meeting with a prospect and we find out what their needs are and we find out what's going on and they go, I tell you what, why don't you throw a proposal together for me? Oh, great, that's good. I run back to the office. Now I'm working on the proposal. I'm looking at the numbers and I start negotiating with myself. Like, how are they going to react when they see this? Now, maybe I can shave this off. Maybe I can do that. I think I'll go in with a discount right up front. Maybe it'll shorten my cycle, right? Anyone have that head trash going on? Well, what that tells me if that's going on is you did not have an investment step. In your, uh, it means I didn't have a real human-to-human -human conversation about what it might cost to do this and to test their willingness to spend that kind of money to fix their pain. It's not about me. Write these words down. It's all about them. It's not about me. Stop thinking about my sale. It's all about them. So assuming I figured out and I, and I teach approaches and techniques to get the real budget on the table to find out, because I, if I ask, hey, so what's your budget for this? What do most people say? Don't know. Haven't really thought about it. The wall is up, right? So how do we engage in that conversation in a different way than saying, geez, you know, do you have budget for that? Um, next, decision process. How many of us, now we do the proposal, we come back and they say, hey, this looks great. You gave me a lot to think about. Um, and then I say, well, geez, you know, so would you like to get going with this? And they go, whoa, 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 not so fast, Charlie. Right? You know, then all of a sudden the wall goes up. And they say, geez, you know, I, I, maybe I forgot to tell you, but we have to bring this up to the uh, executive board. Or, you know what, this really gave us a lot of food for thought. I think we'll set up a committee <laughs> and, and, and we'll really start to investigate it. And I haven't really looked at any other alternatives yet, so I really need to do my due diligence. You start getting that stuff. The reason you're getting that after you've delivered your proposal, you notice I haven't done a proposal yet. That's a, a key thing, hopefully, to notice. It means that I've done a proposal before I truly understood the decision process. Perfect world, when would they want to start the membership with the, uh, with the club? Perfect world, when would they want to start in tab? Um, how are you going to go about making that decision? What could, who could veto that? And you go, geez, who, who's going to make that decision? They're like, me, I make the decisions. How many times do you find out that person doesn't make the decision? So we got to have another question. It's always about the next question. Good question to leave with. Who could veto your decision if you decided you really wanted to do this? Who in the organization could veto your decision? You're going to find out something different. So decision process, do I know the who, the what, the where, the when, the why, and the how of the decision process? I, 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 in that step alone, I've come up with 58 different questions just in the uh, decision step in the Sandler cycle. Not that I would ever ask all 58, but I like to challenge myself sometimes coming up with how many I can come up with. 58. Um, so once I've uncovered these three things, I've either qualified or disqualified the deal. No pain, no sale, no budget, no sale, no decision, no sale, right? Because you're going to find that stuff out later, figure it out sooner. Um, so if I've done that, only then do I jump to the next step, which is the uh, solution presentation. And by solution presentation, what I'm doing is I'm presenting back, and the Sandler rule is you can only present to the pains you've uncovered. So what pressure does that put on me as a salesperson? I better uncover some pain or I have nothing I can show, right? So a solution presentation versus a generic presentation should be specific to the pain that you uncovered with them. And a trick there is review their pain before you go into the solution, right? Bring them back to their pain before you get into the solution. And assuming I do that, the close is like nothing. They're like, wow, this guy understands my world. This guy really listened. These numbers didn't shock me, right? I, I never shock anyone with numbers because they know what the numbers are before I got there, right? I understood the decision process, so all the decision makers are in the room. I also have an upfront contract before the presentation about what might happen next, so there's no pressure when I get there. If I don't talk about what's going to happen next, it's going to put pressure on me and put pressure on them. So I diffuse the pressure through the use of an upfront contract before the presentation, if you follow what I'm saying. So now, you know, what, could, what could be the possible outcome? You may look at this and hate the proposal and decide not to do it. And that's okay. If that's the case, I want you to tell me that. Or secondly, you may decide, hey, this is the best thing I've ever seen. It's right in alignment with what I was hoping for. What do I need to sign something? Most of my clothes are, do I need to sign something to get started? You know, it's really not a high pressure thing. And then lastly, and I'll leave you with this, is the post-sell step. How many people here, just a quick question, have ever sold a deal and two days later you get the proverbial call, hey, uh, are you sitting down? Uh, it, 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 yeah, th yeah, this is Chip. Yeah, we, we, I signed your contract last week. Yeah, you know, I, I've had second thoughts about this. You know, I talked with my wife. And, you know, we've decided, you know, we, we actually put a stop order on the check. Anyone ever have that happen to them in sales? I, I heard some uh, reverberations. If, if you have, I have an antidote to that. 
and, and deal with that up front. Deal with buyer's remorse before you leave. I was taught the wrong way. When you get the contract sold, get out quick because all you can do is mess it up. Right? That's what my boss taught me. I was 22 years old. I probably could mess it up. But he never taught me what to do. So it, you, don't fix something that ain't broke. So if it doesn't happen to you, don't worry about this part of the step. But if you ever have had it happen, talk them through. Hey, you know, and you could be concerned that your competitor is going to come in, drop their price, and convince them to go a different direction. In the insurance world, I've seen this happen a lot. Right? Now they go back to the guy they've had insurance for 15 years. They say, geez, you know, I decided to go with her. This really looks good. I kind of like her. We want to do it. Oh, you got to be kidding me. You're, you're, sweet. you're leaving me after all these years? You know, they, they try to guilt them into it. And they're like, well, I kind of know her, but man, I've known him for longer. And then he goes, I'll give you a 20% discount just to keep you happy. And now your deal's gone. So a post-sale step would be talking that through with the buyer before, they, uh, uh, before you leave the room. Only, but don't fix it if it ain't broke. Two other things to remember at a post-sale step. One, and this can build your business faster than anything I've talked about today. Ask for referrals. And don't ask that, don't say, don't, don't do the techniques I've seen where they shove a blank piece of paper under, under your nose and say, hey, write down 20 names of people you know that I could call. You know, don't do that. Just say something like this, light, and say, geez, I'm not looking now, but let's fast forward. Let's say you're happy with the services I'm delivering and your computers are up and running and the problems you used to have have gone away and you like the customer service level we've given you. At that point, would you be comfortable sharing with me other names of business owners like yourself that are in your circle that may be open to a conversation with someone like me? How low key is that? But it's assertive, right? How many times do we close the deal and never ask that question? And that is, my friends, an upfront contract for future referrals. So it'll make asking for a referral later on much easier. Third thing, if you cross sell, upsell, they may be joining the membership. Uh, for the uh, health club, but they haven't signed up for everything or they may have done the three-month thing. Have an upfront contract for those other things you didn't sell today about when it might make sense for us to sit, at, sit down and take a look at it. They may do the security system, but they haven't done the, uh, the home video surveillance system. And we're kind of interested in, when should I circle around and talk to you about that? I don't want to pressure you, but you know, I want to make sure I don't miss something. So that is the Sandler selling system in one hour. Um, I apologize if I was running fast. I did a two-hour session in one hour. Um, and you, you guys may be more exhausted than me, but I want to leave some time for questions, uh, comments, questions. Who's got a question that you're sitting there going, man, yeah, I don't think this really is real? You know, yeah. Good question. So in the investment discussion, yes. you briefly talked about make sure you know what their budget is or if they have a budget or anything. Yep. 99% of the time, we, get, we don't know what it is or whatever. How do you, like, How do you approach that subject? A couple that. ways. Uh, one, customer stories are a great way to do it. I do customer stories combined with bracketing. So I go, geez, I'm not 100% sure here, but based on my knowledge of your existing environment, what you share with me today, you know, would it make sense if we talked a little bit about what the numbers might be? How low key is that? You know, is that trusted advisor? Would it make sense if we spent a little bit of time talking about what it might cost if you were to do stuff like this? What do you think they say? Yes, they usually say yes. Yeah, it probably makes sense to talk about this. If I go, so what's your budget for this? <laughs> what do you think they say? It's a little bit different. You see the subtle difference? And then I may say, well, geez, you know, I'm guessing you probably don't have a line item in your budget for sales training, right? And they always say, you're absolutely right. We have no line item for sales training. Didn't think so. Not much different than most people I talk to. But while we're talking about it, you know, I had another client like you, they had five sales guys and we did this and this and this and I can't remember the numbers exactly, but it cost about this. You know, somewhere between this and that, should we even continue this conversation if that were the case? How low key is that? Go for no, unattached to the outcome, skeptical? Should I even continue this discussion? Right, who's selling who at that point? They're selling me, not me selling them. So hopefully that helps. That's, yeah. that's like the context behind some of these things with the approach. Any other questions? Well, if not, I'll be around for uh, those private questions you want to ask that you, you didn't want to say in front of the group. But uh, yes? I have basically little to no trained sales experience at all. And I'm looking to get sales training for myself, but also so one or two of the associates. Do you have, let's say, entry level you know, information versus a mid-level versus a, a higher level, basically breaking it down for donors? The answer is yes. Yeah, we have a foundations program versus an advanced program because if you threw someone who hadn't sold before into advanced, they'd be lost. They wouldn't even know what we're talking about. So yeah, you got to start with some foundational uh, series of things like today, which would be, you know, 
not done so quickly as today to start off. Any other questions? Yeah, Tom. I just realized I, I lose a lot of money where I deal with a lot of moms that are the ones that make the initial call. And the thing I always get at the end is, I got to discuss this with my husband. Mm -hmm. So my thing is, do I literally say, I'm going to call you back tomorrow at noon to see what his decision was? Or, no. Okay. See, the problem I have right now in a cycle, no matter what the cycle is, no matter what you're selling, so what you're describing is, I'm at the end of that first call, the lady says, I got to talk to my husband. So the problem I have right now has nothing to do with right now. It has to do with what led up to right now. The, the antidote to that is the upfront contract in that discussion saying, geez, I don't know about you, but you know, I've been doing this a while. You know, and uh, typically, the husband and wife get involved in these kind of discussions. Before we set a meeting, can we kind of take a look at his calendar, maybe have the two of you there? That'll save you a ton of time just doing that. Have the decision makers in the room when you're looking to make a decision, because that's always the outlet, right? Well, I got to talk to my husband. I got to talk to my wife, whichever side it is. Right? Yeah, so do that upfront. The upfront contract is the antidote for most ills in sales. Is that it? Well, thank you very much. Hope you got some value out of it.